Morning, church. Morning. All right. It's 500th anniversary of the Reformation. It's kind of a big deal. It's like really a big deal. The first service, I even had my red stole. The whole thing, thanks to the to everybody, Lynn, your team, for changing the pyramids to reflect our special day. Wanted to share some scriptures with you. Romans chapter 3, 19 through 28. Paul writes these words. <clears throat> now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Be with us now, O Lord, and open your word to us. And bring your word to life as we reflect not only upon the Reformation, but also upon the Reformer and the transformation that awaits each of us as we discover who we are in you and that we are yours and we are justified through the works and the merits of Christ alone. And since this has happened, we are heirs <clears throat> to every blessing through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Today we celebrate, and pardon me, I know that I'm going to be relying quite a bit upon my notes. So uh, please pardon me while I do that. But you see, I'm going to be addressing Luther as not only theologian, but really father and husband. Because the Reformation isn't just simply about something in history, but rather the impact of a discovery like Luther had that one special moment in which he described it was as if all of heaven was open to him. And in that moment, he discovered who he was as God's child. And that was such a, a great experience for him, that joyful discovery of God's love. And that if he is adopted and a child of God's, that he is also an heir. So today we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, Luther's rediscovery of the biblical principles that we are saved by grace alone, faith alone, the word alone. Robert Farrah Capon described the Reformation 
in this way. The Reformation was a time when men went blind, staggering drunk because they had discovered in the dusty basement of late medievalism a whole cellar full of 1,500-year-old, 200-proof grace. <laughs> bottle after bottle, a pure distillate of scripture, one sip of which would convince anyone that God saves us single-handedly. The word of the gospel, after all those centuries of trying to lift yourself into heaven by worrying about the perfection of your bootstraps, suddenly turned out to be a flat announcement that the saved were home before they started. Grace has to be drunk straight. No water, no ice, and certainly no ginger ale. <laughs> Neither goodness nor badness not the flowers that bloom in the spring of super spirituality could be allowed to enter into the case. Isn't that a great quote? I have to, I have to let you know, I have been sitting on that quote for a very long time. Just couldn't wait. And I thought the 500th anniversary was so appropriate. The Reformation had to first emanate from the heart of the Reformer, Martin Luther. First, his relationship with God. You see, it was more than a theology. It was a joyful discovery of his identity as God's child. It really was a discovery of his own Sonship in Christ. But some eight years later, in 1525, he marries Catherine von Bora, now the heart of the reformer, could know God's love as it is manifested yet in another way, in marriage. First love is drunken, said Luther. But when the intoxication wears off, then comes true marriage love. If the, if, if the Reformation was a revolution in theology, the recovery of the gospel was, after all, a recovery of true marriage love. That would be Christ's love for his bride, us, the church. Luther's marriage was about to be, for him, a revolution in everything, including hygiene. Did you remember that Luther had been a bachelor for a very long time? Can you imagine what Catherine von Bora inherited in their marriage? Suddenly she goes on their wedding night and here they are. Who knows if those sheets after all these years of being a bachelor have even been washed. And then in the middle of the night on their wedding night comes the knock at the door. None other than Andreas Karlstadt is there and he has some questions for Luther now how would you like that on your wedding night my goodness Luther called marriage the school of character no doubt it was to be a lifetime tutorial that worked both ways while Catherine had her work cut out for her living with a giant man like Luther Marriage would require still more radical adjustments for Luther. 
There is a lot to get used to in the first year of marriage, he said. One wakes up in the morning and finds a pair of pigtails on the pillow, which were not there before. Can't you just about see him there? See, where God's word is rightfully applied, there is joy and laughter in the midst of life's frailties. And the Luther home was full of life and love. It became, as is well attested in history, a model of the Christian home. I have to tell you, Luther was so fond of children. Could you imagine not only how the reformer's life would change and be impacted by having a wife, but as he became a father as well. He admired their simplicity the, the, of children and he admired their trustfulness. Even though he wed later in life, his 21 <coughs> years of marriage were blessed with six children the oldest, John, better known as Hans, was named after his grandfather. On the occasion of his birth, Luther opened his heart in a letter to his friend Spallantin. He said this, I am a happy husband, and may God continue to send me happiness, for from this most precious woman, my best of wives, I have received by the blessing of God a little son, John Luther, and by God's wonderful grace, I have become a father. Man, could you almost imagine Luther smoking a stogie, passing out to his friends, so excited to be a daddy? Of the seven-month-old Hans, he wrote, My little Hans sends greetings. He is in his teething month and is beginning to say daddy and scolds everybody with pleasant insults. But the affectionate father suffered intensely when Elizabeth, who was born December 10, 1527, born a year after Hans, died as a baby. My little daughter Elizabeth is dead, he wrote to a friend. She has left me strangely sick at heart. I would never have believed that a father's heart could be so tender for this child. Please pray to God for me. Luther, as a grieving father. Wow. The sorrow eased with the birth of another daughter, Magdalena, in 1529. A very beautiful girl with a sweet disposition. She was named after Aunt Lena, who lived in the Luther household. The father seemed to dote on her as little Lenchen. Another son was born November 9th, 1531, and named after his father since their birthdays almost matched. My little Martin, he writes, my little Martin is my dearest treasure. Hans and Lena can now speak and do not need much care. Therefore it is that parents always love the little infants who need their love the most. What a heart stab it must have been to Abraham when he was commanded to take his only son's life. Truly I would dispute with God if he bade me do such a thing. Did you just about see Luther so taken by a child? I'll tell you what, Ben and I were talking uh, just on Friday night about there's, there's something about a, a little one that makes every, every adult within like 20 yards turn into just kind of like a, a blubbering goofball. <laughs> Suddenly, don't you just, just look at him like, <laughs> making little fish faces and stuff like that. Could you imagine Luther doing those kinds of things as well? On January 28, 1533, the Luthers received a third son. At the baptism the next day, the proud parents, uh, uh, Luther said to the sponsors, a new pope has just been born. You will help the poor fellow 
to his rights. I have called him Paul, for St. Paul has given me many good sayings and arguments, wherefore I wish to honor him. The last child, Margaret, was born in 1534, named after Luther's recently deceased mother. She was the only one of the three daughters to reach maturity. Even the unfortunate happenings of fatherhood didn't dampen Luther's love. One day, when the baby, after the manner of children, dirtied Papa's lap, he turned to his guests and good-naturedly explained that the child's performance was no different from the way we treat our own Heavenly Father. God cares and provides for us, and we repay Him with the filth of sin and ingratitude. Isn't that just like a theologian? I would do something like that, huh? On another occasion, when the child was screaming at the top of his voice because he couldn't have his own way, Luther mused, what cause have you given me to love you so? How have you observed or deserved to be my heir by making yourself a general nuisance? And why aren't you thankful instead of filling the house with your howls? Any of you parents ever been there? <laughs> but Luther recognized that children need discipline. In the Christian home, respect for parents and love for parents go hand in hand. He could vividly recall the severe punishment he had received as a uh, youth for stealing a nut. Now, Luther was not always so firm and gentle. Once Hans angered his father to such an extent, he must have, uh, Hans must have been a teenager at this point. He angered him so much that despite Katie's pleas, Luther refused to forgive the boy for three days. Luther knew that obedience was important to God. But Luther came down very hard on any form of child beating that gave vent to a parent's anger and merely satisfied his own feelings. He wrote these words uh, commenting on Paul's words in Colossians 3.21. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Have you, have you read that? Yeah, very important. Luther commented on that passage by saying, this is spoken against those who use passionate violence in bringing up their children. Such discipline begets in the child's mind, which is yet tender, a state of fear, and develops a feeling of hate toward the parents so that it runs away from the home. Yet St. Paul does not mean that we should not punish children, but that we should... Um, truly correct them with love, seeking not to cool our anger, but to encourage them or make them better. Can you imagine 500 years or so before um, folks like James Dobson and Christian psychologists would come along? Here is Luther in the Reformation in his writings. And he's in his writings, he's publishing these kinds of things. And they're spreading like the wings of the morning. And they're, being, they're traveling out throughout Europe and beyond. These words of encouragement and instruction on the care and the nurture of children. That's a very powerful thing to consider, especially in medieval days. And the ways that, that children were treated and perceived. Luther is done, doing none other than adding such great dignity to a child's place and recognizing the faith, emotional, and spiritual potential of a child. They didn't get that at the first service. Okay. See, that's why you're going to come to the second service. <laughs> the Prince of Anhalt once warned a friend, you'll like this, the house of Luther is occupied by a motley crowd of boys, students, girls, widows, old women, and youngsters. 
For this reason there is much disturbance in the place, and many regret it for the sake of the good man, the Honorable Father. I would not advise your grace to ever stop by there. <laughs> but Luther himself didn't mind all the activity in the Luther household. He said, King Solomon fed 24,000 people every day. And all the poor relations from his father's house came to stay in the palace, just as happens here in the Black Monastery. That's why the king needed so many wives. They were all of them kept pretty busy. Well, I have to tell you, in Catherine von Bora, he had a very enterprising and industrious wife. And he called her Katie Myred. And she was not only his uh, helpmate, but she was really outstanding in so many facets of uh, business and running the Luther household. And there was, she had a farm that she managed as well as a, a fish pond where they were doing none other than harvesting fish, Ben, way back before aquaponics. And that was going on. It's a good thing. So with this background, we begin to understand Luther's emphasis on the importance of the home in Christian education. Luther sat down with his children daily to review the basics of God's word. He did it in this way. He said this. He said, though I'm a great doctor, I haven't yet progressed beyond the instruction of children in the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer. I still learn and pray these every day with my Hans and my little Lena. And that's why he prepared for quick publication in January 1529, a catechism in the form of charts to be hung on the wall. The first edition was sold out in less than a month, and by June of that year, a third and an, and an enlarged and revised edition appeared. And Luther uh, championed the home altar and wanted to be the home, uh, wanted the, the home, each home, to be a place of worship, not just in the cathedrals, but in every home, in every land. Much of the success of the catechism can be explained by his use of down-to-earth expressions and the rhythm of language. And we know so much about Luther and how he loved to sing and, uh, and utilize songs. No doubt he utilized children's songs as well to help even uh, the youngest to learn the scriptures. In talking as people talk, Luther hoped to help the parent to act as, he would say, bishop in his own house. In this, Luther himself took the lead. Can you imagine? He championed that lead. Luther lived with a deep-seated awareness of his responsibility as a Christian father who must oversee his children in good days as well as the cheerless. Luther was a man who wore his heart on his sleeve, whose faith was so deep and transparent that all around him knew of it. No wonder this father felt such great sorrow when his 14-year-old daughter, Magdalena, who had captured her father's heart, died. I love her so much, he confessed. And as she lay on her deathbed, he asked, Magdalena, my dear little daughter, would you like to stay here with your father? Or would you willingly go to your father yonder? Darling father, she replied, as God wills. And then he reproached himself for not wanting to let her go. I love her so very much, he repeated. If my flesh is so strong, what can my spirit do? God has given no bishop so great a gift in a thousand years as he has given me in her. I'm angry with myself that I cannot rejoice in heart and be thankful 
as a heart. He fell down on his knees and he wept bitterly and prayed that God might treat her. And sometimes that's the greatest gift, is to allow the one that you love to go. <clears throat> Completely into God's complete presence and to experience that complete healing. So she died there in her father's arms. Luther, the great in father. As they laid her in the coffin, Luther said, Darling Lena, you will rise and shine like a star. Yea, like the sun. I'm happy in spirit, but the flesh is sorrowful will not be content. The parting grieves me beyond measure. I have sent a saint to heaven. That's really the heart of the reformer. And so beat the heart of a Christian father and the husband, who was greatly concerned to provide a home for his family where Christ and the Word of God held foremost place. And if it were us, could we hope for much more? And what good is a reformation at all if not that it first affect the very heart of each person? each child of God, to come to that realization and how, what it is that for us to discover that we are a child of God and how does that affect us? What does that mean to us as a husband, a wife, father, mother? And that we are heirs to the riches in Christ Jesus. Not just that being an heir means we get to go to heaven, but that we are heirs to the kingdom in the here and now and that which is to come. That Christ be the center of each person's heart, each home, even at the center of the place where God has called us to serve. The many great contributions of the Reformation can be asserted. But greatest of all is God's desire not to simply reform the human heart, but to adopt us and place his heart within us and make us his heirs. That was the great joy that Luther discovered that affected so many areas of his life. So you see that is much that discovery is much greater than reformation. That's transformation. So the five hundred year anniversary of the Reformation. Yet, the joy is ours every time we discover who we are in Christ. Every time we discover that we belong to Him and His family. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Thank you, Almighty God, for the life of the Reformer. And Lord, this continues to go on each time a person comes to faith and comes to realize that they are loved with a love 
We are loved with a love that even we can't mess up. We are loved with a love that is beyond us. And at great cost to yourself, you have given yourself so that we can be incorporated into your family. Grant that we would live our lives in gratitude as heirs, treating one another as fellow heirs and caring for the world that you have entrusted to us as princes and princesses in your kingdom. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Peace of the Lord is with you always. <clears throat>